without standing in the way of some people's long weekends. <laughs> but I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. Um, so I'm currently a solution consultant with Oracle, uh, which basically means that I have the opportunity to interact with a variety of customers and really get involved earlier in the process as they're conceptualizing their programs. And I, my, my responsibility is to help our customers connect their use cases to technology that, that we have available and see where there's some synergies there, where there's a best fit, potential partnerships. So it's a really neat role where I get to use a lot of the experience that I've kind of collected along my, my career. Um, so in terms of where I started, I'm a biostatistician by training. Um, I, I started in the world of public health with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm still based out of. Uh, at the CDC, I was a data manager for um, a couple of the largest chronic disease surveillance programs that we have. So um, breast cancer, colorectal cancer were kind of under my umbrella, and my job there was to help uh, help researchers interact with the data, familiarize themselves with the data in order to really create some value, some added value in that secondary analysis. Um, from there, I wanted to go more into the, the clinical space. My first love was really the clinical trial space, and I got the opportunity to do that in, in several different roles. Um, one of the, the one that would be the most relevant here is how I ended up in, in the world of genomics and precision medicine. And that was through the Children's Hospital in Atlanta, being uh, the lead bi biostatistician for the cardiology service line, really um, allowed me to start putting some pieces together. So I came from the world of, of public data, so I was very familiar with that side, and it was really creating the ecosystem for both for the researchers in order to do what they wanted to do that, was, that necessitated data across a lot of different domains genomics being, being part of that. Uh, cardiology, pe uh, pediatric cardiology is, is the majority of it is, um, it's, um, it's, it gets inherited, uh, or it, uh, and there's a genomic test associated with it. We've gotten really, really good at screening, uh, at the standard screening in the United States. So uh, there was a lot of the, this data that researchers weren't comfortable using just yet. Uh, and this was five years ago, which, which is like, 500 years ago in the next time, so um, now we've definitely made some strides. So today, what I, um, when, when we were um, informed that we had the opportunity to be here today, uh, what my team did, so, so my team at Oracle, uh, we are scientists, so we have people who have done um, been on the bench side, we have, I'm kind of the, the mid part of the analytics, we have people who have actually implemented this out in the field um, from a clinician perspective. So. We had the opportunity to sit down and we wanted to, we were trying to figure out how to bring the best value, right? So I'm here, obviously, very subtly as a vendor. Um, but, you know, what we really wanted to do was to bring some value in, in, in terms of what we learned, being exposed to the number of, of, of organizations and, and processes that we've seen. So that's my goal today. And, um, we are going to discuss some product towards the end, so this is my safe harbor statement. But what I wanted to do today was just this quick, this introduction of how we got here, uh, and then go a little bit into some key questions that we've seen out in the field and how we've been able to answer those through technology. So um, I wanted to keep it pretty, pretty broad just to really kind of get the, the wheels turning in terms, in terms of some of the, the questions we may have and just facilitate the discussion later. Uh, and then I want to go over our approach, right? So how is Oracle specifically, um, what, what was our answer to what we've seen out of the field, and what is our answer today, and how is the next generation of that coming along for us? And then hopefully um, they, there will be um, some discussion. So this is my favorite slide, and um, it really gets to, um, to the bottom of, of why we do what we do. Uh, at Oracle, and it's it's really about where the workload goes into uh, when we're trying to accomplish something with data. So we've gotten really good at collecting data across all domains, whether that's uh, clinical data through EMRs, whether that's um, genomic data through the types of genetic testing that we're doing, oncology being one of the leaders in that space. We got really good at the collection part. And now we're in a really awkward transition. We're in our teenage years of trying to figure out how to actually use the data 
and translate that data and, and realize the value of that data. So as a biostatistician, I, I, mean, I used to, for, for, for when I was working on different projects, I would have to track my hours. So I would have this little report that would tell me how, how, what I was spending the most time on. And um, in, in a regular project, in a regular, maybe like an operations project, a clinical operations project, about 70% of my time was, was spent chasing down the data, cleaning the data, standardizing the data, and then the 30% was the actual analytics part. So whether that was, that was the, the analyzing part, the summarizing the results, and you know what, what I consider the fun part, I don't know if you call that, but I consider the fun part. Um, when it came to genomics projects, that number was very, very skewed, and about 90% of my time was spent doing this. And then I kind of was spent kind of chasing it down, making sense of it, trying to see uh, how it fit into what we wanted to accomplish. And then the 10% was actually done doing the analytics of it. Um, so during that process, I realized that something needed to happen from the technology. And, and a lot of it was technology related, right? The systems that held the genomics data were in a very different place. There were not a lot of experts that could deal with it, that were comfortable dealing with it. So by the time that we got over the hump of, you know, we actually want to include this into our analytics, we see the value uh, of bringing in the genomic data, then we were running into the issue that uh, we have to chase out that data, and that was really, really a painful process. So um, that being said, uh, this is part of what, uh, what we've been trying to fix and that we've been trying to address at Oracle uh, for over a decade. And um, I wanted to start with this question because I think this is a question that a lot of uh, people in the process of implementing precision medicine are trying to answer. And there is not one answer. You're not either clinical or research, but what we've seen is that uh, it changes the way that you implement the technology, right? So um, you're asking, are we a research institution? Are we a clinical institution? And how do we allow for those two use cases to run in parallel? where well, we are really distributing our resources. And that's really what it comes down to, is distributing your resources to support both. Um, so some of the challenges there when you are both and you're trying to accomplish both is how you're consenting the data. Uh, how do we take the data from the patients, right? We have a very specific diagnosis, but that's usually how we're gonna initiate, right? There's a diagnosis, then uh, there's a uh, specialty for something like oncology, there will be a certain panel that you're running for that patient, and and that panel may, may actually just bring back a few variants that are actually, that are actionable, but there's a wealth of information there that we don't want to waste, right? And I think that's what, that's in the back of the mind of any one of the researchers that we're kind of already collecting this data. So one of the big challenges there is how do we consent for this type of information? Mainly because we don't know what we don't know yet, uh, so we have to be really careful with the consenting process. Uh, then, then sharing of that data. Uh, Depending on, on how the data is uh, comes back, if it's a, if, it, if the data is associated uh, with a diagnosis, then one of the options, and what we've seen mostly in the U.S. is that, uh, and in our implementations, is that the data comes back as a result, as a lab result into the EMR. But that's obviously kind of the summary part of it. There's still a lot of information and a lot of um, a lot of detail that does not go into that. So. Thinking through that has been one of the big things that we've encountered. Um, terminating consent. One, when a patient does no longer wants to be part of a study or wants to be part of a certain baseline, how do we uh, allow that from a technology perspective? And uh, a big, big issue that we see here is how do we really educate patients on this process? That's, that's one of the things that, how do we help patients be part of, um, help us help the population uh, in, a, in a really educated pro in a really educated way where they're comfortable with what they're providing us and, and the stewardship that we, that we are taking and taking their data. So in terms of solutions, uh, it really has been about how to trace that data. And genomics data is really hard to trace down once it's kind of in the, and goes through the grinder. So being able to, to retain the connections of that data has been one of the key things that, that we found to be uh, the key solution. Um, and another thing here is the role management. I think that's really where, where the key is, is how do we allow different people to have different use of the same data? 
So these are some, there's a couple of ways of how we're addressing that, that kind of consent um, that, that allows for both the research and the, um, and the clinical use. How, uh, the next question is, how do we create a genomics platform uh, without clarity of our potential throughput? And I think this is, we hear this every time we walk in, big or small, a lot of our implementations have been in the large cancer centers, and um, at the end of the day, regardless of how big the cancer center is, it's always a, um, a department level decision of, of how they are actually, uh, their plan and their investment in, in genomic testing and genetic testing. Uh, at a clinical level and a research level. So um, this has been one of the big questions that we've had, and it's all about, um, wrong keyboard, uh, the data volume, data velocity, and data processing. So we are being asked to make decisions. We, meaning being on the other side, uh, we're being asked to make decisions on how much investment we want to make without knowing what our needs are actually going to look like and how our needs are going to evolve. So this is a really key question as you're interacting, um, as you're having the internal conversations and how you're setting up your program, and as you're setting up the conversation with um, the, the vendors or those that are going to help you get there, this is really a key question to ask, because how is the solution going to scale at all the different levels, not just the how I store the data or I process the data, but as the data changes as well and the data types change. So this is my kind of my, my, my pet project, which is how do we enable the secondary use of data. Um, as a researcher, my passion has really been really amplifying the, the, the benefit of the data that we've collected. And if we get through the, the policy part of it, of the, of the consent part, but then uh, now you're getting into the logistics of it. So how do we actually logistically enable secondary use of data? And uh, data access, that's, that's the top one, right? So how do we, um, how do we allow uh, researchers to, uh, and, and other clinicians to access the data? How do we create an approval process that, um, that beyond the IRB on the technology level allows us to um, centrally manage access? Uh, how, do we, how do we talk about discovery research? This is a really um, delicate conversation in genomics, which is, Part of, it, part of the process is really a discovery process where we don't necessarily have a very specific hypothesis in mind. So how do we enable that and what is the types of data that we are comfortable uh, giving access to uh, for this type of study? And then data privacy, uh, evolving insights is another one. And by that I mean as new things come up, how do we kind of go back and, and, and look at the data again to make sure that, that we're not missing anything, that we're not missing an opportunity uh, to, to treat a patient as things have changed uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the field. And the solutions that we found here are, I guess the answer really depends. And it really depends on, on what the goals of, of the organization are. So uh, in, in the US, you know, we can think of a federated model and, and, as, and from what I've the experience that I've had here so far, it seems like that's really what uh, is the standard here. It's kind of a federated model. Everyone owns their data. There's very specific um, policy around what data wants, uh, we need to share. And then on the technology side, the technology's there in order to enable that, right? So we have <coughs> cloud models and uh, hybrid models, uh, on-premise models of where the data can actually reside. Uh, but then the integration part is where, where the Bulls really is, right? So uh, we've got a really good federated model. Um, then the, the other issue here in terms of the, the, you know, the, the genomic data is the, the data redaction. So going back to when we're talking about the, the when something is, when the data is, uh, a genetic test is done, uh, there's only going to be a few variants that are relevant for that, for that patient treatment and, and, the, and the physician support piece. So what, what happens to the rest of that data, and how much of it, how, how much is the researcher going to have access to? Um, so the, the data ownership piece, um, a lot of the resistance from the researchers is they are being funded to, to run some of this data. So how do they kind of control uh, the, the access to it? How do they retain some control over it? So it doesn't, because once it's out in the, in the field, then 
you know, that they, they, it loses a lot of the context. So how do we retain some of the context around that? And then I always go back to the patient education because the patient education has to be kind of a common thread throughout this whole process. Um, this one is about, and, 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 and this question is coming up more and more as things are changing even more rapidly. So how do we uh, enable evolving knowledge? And I think what every organization is trying to get to uh, is uh, a knowledge base. So we don't want to keep repeating the same things. And then a knowledge base on a clinical level, right, so we're, we're creating decision support uh, to be able to enable the molecular pathologist workflow of uh, what variants uh, where, where the annotation process of variants for the clinical support piece, uh, but also a knowledge base of uh, the research that's, that's being done internally. So um, the, the trick there, the tricky part of that is how do we um, keep the connection of all that data while it's de-identified? So once we, once we need to re-report, um, how do we, on a technological with technology, are able to keep all that disparate data in a federated model in a way that you can trace it back and who will have access to that? How do we uh, create those crosswalks, essentially, that once new knowledge is available, we can actually go back all the way to the patient level, to the provider level, to enable the conversation uh, that a report may be added. Enabling and fostering collaborations. And um, this is going back to the, to the data ownership, and this is a research-heavy kind of question. So um, if a researcher is funded to run a certain amount of samples, they run that data, and there is often a deorganizational level uh, once these, these um, data aggregation platforms get uh, implemented, there, there's, a, there's um, policy to be able to provide that data. So how do we enable the, the use case of um, the, the data environment, right? So uh, the, how do we design policies and have an honest conversation of the, of the practical side of it? Researchers want to publish on the work that they've done. They, they need to publish on what they've been funded for. So how do we enable those two use cases where they're able to provide the secondary use and they're able to deploy their data uh, to augment how it's being used or, or to maximize how it's being used while still retaining some of that control in order to do the research that um, they, they set out to do. And, um, you know, the, the, the idea of future proof um, the approach, it's really about the standardization. This is really what we've seen. So when, I, when we talk about future proving, it's, again, going back to like, we don't know what we don't know. And it's not, it's, it's true in, across every industry and in, across every use case, but not, it doesn't move as fast as it does in genomics. So uh, we are, like, we're being asked to make decisions today, and we don't even know what's gonna happen in the next 24 hours. So um, a lot of the, the ways that, that we are solving those challenges are through the standardization level. So it's creating, uh, we have the integration level, and then we have the standardization, and that's the standards, the source data, <laughs> changes, the formats change, we are able to flexibly uh, evolve that as things evolve. So that's one of those um, questions that uh, technology has really been driving uh, and where it really kind of connects to, to what we're trying to do in that use case. So the user experience, um, is really kind of the logistics of it. So now we get we aggregated the data, we have it all there. Um, now we're trying to be everything to everyone, essentially. So we're asking to to be psychic and, and you know know the future. And now we're asking to to be everything to everyone. Any kind of researcher, whether that's a data scientist or a clinician, um, you're being asked to serve that data up to them. So um, and there's. We know that they have different needs, and we don't we know what they're using today, but we don't know what they're going to be using tomorrow. So um, that's one of the, those questions that, that we need to answer really early on. And the answer is not to you know it's not to set a roadmap, but it's to set a flexible roadmap uh, that allows for for those changes. And um, the future. So so. <laughs> 
when at the end of the day you can have all these questions answered, you can have a really candid conversation internally and at the organization level of, of how you want to align, how you want to develop policies, but you just don't know what the future is going to bring. And I think part of that conversation is being comfortable with the uncertainty of, of the field that we're in um, and being open to having the conversation that the decisions that we make today um, we may need to readjust. So creating um, a better process of feedback, um, that's what we've really seen be successful out of the field, right? So sometimes we have a resistance to being wrong and then we keep being wrong for longer. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the thing here personally, when, when I get to have a candid conversation, <coughs> is if, you, if you're gonna fail here, you wanna fail fast. It's really expensive to fail in this space and you want to create um, the, that, um, that, that cadence of checking in and making sure that you're meeting, your, um, you're meeting success um, way more than you would in other types of projects and a bit more candidly than you would in, in other um, IT related projects. So um, that, would, that is what, what we've just really seen be successful out of the field and, and it's, it's a change in, um, in culture. That's really what it comes down to. It's a change in culture, but um, I think that that is what makes or breaks a lot of these programs. So now um, I wanted to go over what Oracle has been doing, and uh, we've been doing we've been at this for, for about twelve years. So just a little bit of history. Um, well, this specific platform twelve years. Oracle's been around for a long time. Um, so this specific platform that we developed just to give you the history on how we ended up on the genomic side. Um, it, it set out to be a healthcare data model. It, it set out to answer some questions in healthcare, but the people who started it were very much from the translational research world. And if you think of translational research 12 years ago, uh, it was really the wild west. It still is, but back then it was definitely the wild west. And um, they were trying to figure out how to really enable a lot of these use cases that people were trying to piece together in, uh, in a in an infrastructure that scaled, but an infrastructure that made sense. Um, and, and a lot of it was kind of like putting, trying to recreate a puzzle of all the pieces, the point solutions, the types of data. So um, that was really the, the original thing. So on this side, uh, since the people who were creating this were actually people who had done the work, um, we knew that we weren't going to change anything for the end users. We didn't want to, uh, whether that was data that was being collected by EMR, or Lim system, or even the flat files, you know, the Excel file, the access database that you have. Um, there's a lot of resistance to change that, so we didn't want to set, go into an organization and tell them they had to get rid of that. That's, that's a process, that's a policy, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. We wanted to allow um, a way to bring in all the different data without changing the end user's experience of how they were entering the data. That heavy lifting to the bottom of that iceberg is all happening here. So this is not just dumping data from one place to another. This is actually taking the data that you're going to use for analytics. So this is not another data repository. This is not another data warehouse. This is true analytical integration, uh, where you're standardizing the data, bringing in terminologies, doing your business, um, uh, your business rules to, uh, to be able to really make sense of it. Uh, and ask real questions that then give you actionable answers. So that's that's what's happening at the center. So um, another thing that, that we set out to do here, and, and I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, we have the omics module, so all, all the genomics data, but we also have the clinical, we have the operational data, so the operational data, so the administrative and the financial data. So we knew that the what we wanted to enable was the view of the patient and the patient population across every domain of that encounter and then across time. Uh, so that's, that's really what we were setting out to do there. And um, the reason why we really wanted to do that was we, did, we don't know what questions we're going to ask, but we know that we're kind of moving in that direction. So, so making that connection just, just made sense very early. Uh, and then it, it actually, you know, a lot of it realized with what we're doing in the U.S. with that increased medicine, where you're really having to look at outcomes uh, and the costing and the resources. So um, that, that's really the focus of it, what you're answering there. And then on the other end, and, and the point there is that you're aggregating one. So 
sure, people are doing this today. And most organizations have five business data warehouses that they're interacting with for the different parts of their business. The point here was that you weren't doing that time and time again. So if I'm in, uh, if I'm in quality and I'm dealing with someone who is on the financial side, we want them to be looking at the same data that's defined the same way. Because often when we think when, when our results don't, don't really harmonize, it rarely has to do with actual mistakes, it has to do with how the data is um, some of the definitions um, that, were, that were made in some of the assumptions. So we wanted to avoid some of that. And then on the front end, um, and, and this would be the end user side, it's about the tools that they're using. So I'm a SAS programmer, I'm not a programmer. I program in Python. I'm not going to switch what I know in order to um, do my job, right? So I come in here, I've been using these tools, they do very specific things. So if I want to talk to a clinician and share those results, I can use another platform, but I want to still be able to use the platforms that, and, and whatever um, system I'm used to interacting with. So um, we also didn't want to use, uh, change that, that workflow uh, in terms of how the, the insights were being generated. Uh, and then the, the last piece here is really about the EMR side. So being able to communicate back to the EMR uh, has been one of the, the big pieces that, that we are doing now, um, especially around precision medicine and the decision support piece. So a little bit more on, on what we did, and, and this is, this is not exhaustive, but this gives you a flavor for what our data model has. Again, this is an, an analytics data model, so it's, it's bringing in your source data regardless of where it comes from, and it's standardizing into a data analytics data model to uh, be able to um, um, harmonize with, with all the data. And this is the omics data model. I uh, think this was updated about a month ago. Um, and this is the results data of the reference data. Something really um, kind of key is that it, your, your reference data, um, your reference sources rather, um, are dynamic. So, so these are, um, these are con we don't make these, we, we don't own these, all we do is connect to these, and then as a customer you set up the cadence of how often they get updated and, and all that. But um, we are not in the business of generating data, we're just in the business of integrating it. So what did we learn doing what we were doing with that platform that I showed you? Um, we learned that we're, we're big. We learned that um, there was, there's definitely a place for uh, the enterprise level uh, analytics and the enterprise level precision medicine. And we also learned that we wanted to create a, a level of, um, we wanted to create a more nimble platform to augment what we were able to accomplish with our core platform. That's what we're calling the next generation genomics. So um, this is using new technology that, that Oracle um, has in its portfolio now. What we're doing is that we're taking smaller parts of our data model, so that big data model and the previous one, we're taking smaller parts of that and making it really dynamic for um, faster throughput and faster use cases. So um, when you think of, I'm sure if you're thinking of the, some of the quick use cases that, that pop to mind, uh, you don't re you may not need all the all the contextual data um, in the first few passes of it. Um, so what this allows you to do is to really minimize the amount of contextual data that you bring in on the fly instead of having to make these decisions ahead of time. And it allows you to make it just a, a little bit more nimble in terms of what you're doing. Um, as you can see, it's it's still uh, the the setup is pretty similar. You have data coming in from different sources, then you have the, the, this container with the data model where uh, all the heavy lifting is being done, and then through this you're able to deploy that data to different applications. It's just, um, it's, it's a bit, um, it's a different use case, so we, we see this a lot at the deployment level, that's where this came from. Uh, so this is our, our response to the department level solution. Uh, in addition to the to the enterprise level solution, so uh, this is something that we're working on today. This is uh, I'll be 
uh, I'll be candid and say that, that this is a, this is roadmap, right? This is what we're working on right now, and uh, we're really passionate about this. We have quite a few customers really excited about this, um, and um, this is this this is where we are as Oracle. And um, if, if there's anything that we've done is, is learn our lessons uh, on the successes and the failures out in the market, uh, and. We have a really tight partnership with our customers that we've really fostered, uh, and we've remained as open as on, and honest as, as we can with, with them as to uh, what's working, what's not, and this is just really where, where we're heading uh, in the next few years. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got a bit of time for question and answer, um, and I should say also we've got um, uh, some food at the end of this, so um, just so we know what time frame we've got to, to do some conversation now, we've got plenty of time, right? Yeah, yeah cool, excellent. Okay, thank you. Right here. So why is this important? Um, for most of you in the room, you'd understand that um, information management, managing all the genomics data is one of the key uh, concerns for us. Um, certainly, um, where we start to think of genomics as not, not just a test, but potentially being able to replace other tests, being, uh, having that information be used ongoing to improve the health of the and outcomes of patients, we have to work out how to manage it. And it has to be integrated with the clinical information that we have. And we also then, in terms of leveraging that for, I'm really trying to get away from primary data and secondary data, because I think that's a really black and white, old school thinking, and we need to get away from that to primary data, which is you know what we collect as a byproduct of a clinical intervention, and then everything from there is downstream. And I would sort of, I would argue that the primary user of that secondary data should actually be the healthcare system. And at the moment, we kind of think of that as research, and that's it's not not sustainable. Um, so this is a really important area uh, for us. And I guess in terms of the questions um, from the group. It'd be lovely if we can get some examples from uh, your client base in the US and potentially other areas to see how other groups that are at the front edge of solving this problem of genomics information management are, are applying the technology you've got today and, and the technologies around that and, and where I guess where you see that sort of that idea going of being able to use the information in a precision medicine approach in, uh, inside the healthcare system rather than that, well, now we've got it and we're going to get a researcher come in and pull some data out and go and do some stuff that we don't really understand or, or right. learn from, right? Because right. that just perpetuates the long cycle of translational research at some point coming back into the system, whereas my view is the system should be collecting the data and using it. So with that in mind, this is why this is a really important presentation and an important topic for us to be thinking about. Um, are there any questions that we've got from the audience um, for Alex today? Absolutely. So right now what we're doing is aligning uh, with that roadmap and kind of maturing along with that. So uh, mm -hmm. essentially it's from a development perspective, we are aligning with, with the roadmap. So there's there's no, um, there, we've been using Angel 7 for a long time for a lot of our transactional data. Um, that, that's been part of, of what, what's been built in in terms of what is a vendor we can ask to do is to align with, with the fire roadmap. And one last geeky question. Why did you use the ensemble annotations? The what? Oh, so if you go back a couple of slides, you were using ensemble as for the gene models. This one up here. Um, was there any uh, reason behind it? Like, I'm an ensemble guy, I really like it, but I know a lot of people love DressSec instead. Um, how, you said we can update them from mm -hmm. the different sources. Yeah. Can you, how easy is it to put in GIF ripped? Um, Databases into this, not just updating the 
It's actually, oh, I'm not going to say this. It's possible, but <laughs> you were going to use okay, it's, it's possible. So we do have a lot of, so, you know, at the, at the, in the grand scheme of things, globally, the, the gen genomic world is pretty big, right? So a lot of these decisions have been made as we've implemented. So as our customer base said, like, we need this now. So, so a lot of it, some of it has been reactive. So we had kind of a proactive umbrella of it, and some of it has been reactive to how our customer base is, is shifting. Good. Thank you very much. So essentially, it's APIs. I mean, most of it's going to be API driven, so that's, that's pretty Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, it's probably, you know, I'm wondering, I'm thinking also in terms of where Oracle uh, sits as part of the solution in the My Health Record, where it's really very much in that space of standards of. Uh, that's page, still page 7 b 3 but that idea of being able to support the uh, collection of clinical information at that level. Yeah, in, in fact, people aren't aware, so um, my health record sits on Oracle Health Data Repository, yeah. and the current version, which is version 7, is there, but there's actually version sort of 8 or 8.1 at the moment, but the latest, latest version is actually fire in the network, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. which was at the request of the Digital Health Agency, but it, it's, it's got value around this, so that hasn't been implemented yet, it's just a you know, general release, it's available. Um, you know, the, the agents actually looking at the moment about what, you know, when they'll get the time, uh, maybe like that. But they, they could have introduced it before they put 20 million people into the system, they thought that was probably a heroic thing to do, they'd get people in first, <laughs> and then upgrade. I, I did want to, Alex, do you want to talk about um, some of the actual sites that we're working with in the US, like the Moffat or MDS and all? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we started with the enterprise level um, platform, some of the kind of initial suspects that, that wanted that needed something uh, were the, the big oncology centers in the US. So Mayo Clinic was one of our first um, implementations, uh, and they were they were really driving a, uh, a research perspective on the data. And then we started talking to Emily Anderson, who was surprised to to see that what they wanted to do was more on the operation side. So um, they wanted to look at their, uh, it was more, it, it was pharmacy operations, and then kind of laying a pharmaco, um, the, the, the pharmaco part on top of it, which was really interesting. So um, so one use case that, that I love going over, uh, and this is published, uh, it was from the Mayo Clinic, and, and the way that this kind of workflow is, is utilized. So um, there were, um, and, and like most research, it was a clinician that kind of observed something as they were treating their patient. So uh, during uh, orthopedic surgery, there were uh, certain patients that were staying in um, post-op uh, post longer than other patients. And the, the, every time that they were kind of querying the clinical data, they were seeing that the cause for this uh, was nausea. They, they had a debilitating nausea that they um, they couldn't um, they had to keep them there so they were stabilized in order to go to um, to the step down unit and then and then beyond and then be discharged. So um, uh, one of the research the, this this clinician contacted a researcher and said, you know, can we get seed money for for some genomic testing? This is really unique. We we haven't really seen this. So it was a very kind of um, I want to say it was hip surgery. Uh, it was uh, that specific. It was hip surgery that they were doing. Um, so what they started, um, they did is that they took a sample of that population and then they looked at the baseline. They looked at the baseline using our system because they had clinical data, uh, and they created kind of a, a virtual, um, a, a virtual uh, distribution of the genomic data that we had available for that population. Uh, and then they did an intervention. So what they did is that they started giving uh, these patients even before they were given they started giving them uh, sofran which is a little bit more expensive as a, as a, it's not the standard treatment for nausea. Uh, so when you're giving a, a pain medication, you're also given something for nausea. And it's usually a um, which has a lot of side effects, and most people don't want to take it, and you know, there's, it's complicated. So for, it's easier for the patients, but it's a lot more expensive, so the system is kind of like a second tier of medication. So what they did when they genotyped without really um, Finding um, the details of it, and we haven't, without having to find the details of it, they found a trend in one of the variants that they were expressing, and right there, that gave them enough um, 
justification to go to the op at the operational side, the quality side, to say we're gonna if a patient gets um, goes through the system. So before when we're getting them, when we're prepping them for surgery, we're gonna do and, and it, luckily, uh, and this is made of money, um, it was about two hundred and fifty dollars to to test these patients for the specific uh, variants, and they were able to. Uh, kind of do this parallel workflow where they were able to implement a certain intervention from a very general trend that they found looking at the clinical data, the, the surgery data, and the genomic data uh, to do this in parallel uh, to see if the outcomes were different. So as they were getting, once they, they, they did the research, and like I said, this is published, they saw that there was kind of a, a very, very different than how these patients were reacting to Fenergan. Uh, and some of them were processing it so fast that it didn't have time to work, and it actually made them feel sicker. So, so it kind of made sense for them. But they were able to implement the intervention uh, at the same time as they were kind of getting through um, the, the, the depth of, of, the, of the research. And um, that, that was one of the really, the, the really neat use cases because um, that's what we're finding more and more is that you, you start asking questions and uh, first, you don't have your baseline, so you don't really know um, how that's going to impact the population. And in and, and genomics, we're trying to find um, the justification for the investment. That's really a big piece of what we're trying to do at a clinical level, is how do we justify the, the cost of the test um, with the outcomes that are going to be generated if we can't really pinpoint the outcome. So that was just kind of a, a – and it was – it was pure luck, I think, because it was actually a really simple test. Most most genomic tests are not going to be two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, this one ended up being something that was really inexpensive, and then now is something that's implemented there uh, in the orthopedic. Um, it first got implemented in the orthopedic um, um, surgery, but then uh, they've been looking at deploying it to other um, surgery centers or surgery articles. Cool. Cool. Hi, thanks for talking. I think I have a question for both of you. You're saying that you work, you work sort of very closely with clients, so that, what, that your solution is client specific or case specific. Um, so, you know, I've been to a number of these talks here, and you know, Dave, and there's lots of federated systems out there. Mm. So, is it the case that, you know, there's not a one size fits all? But then, if that's the case, then how do you benchmark? How do you compare, you know, one federated system to another, assuming that so you have the same data, which one works better, one not the other? Yeah. <coughs> Um, okay, so I can't speak on behalf of Queensland Health of how it's going to actually sort all this out, but I'll tell you what I think. I think that the challenge is, and we saw this in the health program as well, we kind of we chase the paper trail. So there's a bit of paper that goes from one organisation to another in paper, all by fax. Oh, let's make that electronic. Okay, so that's a sort of the short run, and there's some short economies there. Um, I think the equivalent of that is kind of the idea at the moment is we put the electronic medical record, and we're, we're effectively replacing uh, you know, a paper record for an individual, and the objective is to make it easier to put the data in and easier to get the data out about the patient. But the byproduct of all that work is this collection of information. And when we understand that collection of information and its relationship to other sets of information, then we can mine it and we can understand that. Now, that journey is absolutely present in the electronic medical rollout plan system rollout in Queensland, where you look at uh, an early hospital that went into this, like the PA hospital, have moved beyond that conversation about the challenges for the clinicians and the workforce and how all the process changes to going, now we can understand the patient's journey and the patient's journey through a ward. And we can start to understand the performance of the hospital system based on data that's captured about individual patients. And then when you combine that with really other important information, so I see Mark's here, so that idea of the, 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 the pedigree, the hereditary information, how that important is important to genomics and the genetic health service, um, or into how we are planning workforce um, and those administrative functions. So Queensland Health is still a closed environment and is obviously on a pathway to work out how to get those sets of information in a federated sort of manner. But they'll always sort of be bound by where the data is collected and, and the, the ownership of that data at that point. But how do we extract it and add value? So that's kind of, I guess, my sort of view of where this will go. So in this slide, sorry to do this to your slides, you sort of source data, and then this is about extracting value from this. But we still think of the collection of data, um, and we try and work out what the value proposition around that is, rather than go, hang on a second, there's this 
amazing byproduct of value from that data if we conceptualise the value rather than thinking about, well, we just collected it for this point to serve a clinical intervention. So I guess tools like this that will help bring the information together and make sense of it, and then the system starts using that to think about how to operate hospitals, wards, create better patient outcomes, that's the opportunity. So I guess in terms of what you're benchmarking, so I guess you're, you're looking at benchmarking two things, right? So you're, you're, if you're thinking of like the IT side, so how do we benchmark the performance of the system, that's one thing. But I think the, the, the most important thing to benchmark to your point is the results, right? Because we, we don't want to do this for the sake of doing it. I mean, we, we want to really pin down what the, what the benefit of it is and what the, the results of it are. So I, I think it's, it's almost starting backwards, right? So it's like, what questions do we want to answer? And where, because of those questions, where do we need to invest in this middle layer, right? Because you're not going to need all this, which is the point that I wanted to make with the data model. You don't need all the, you don't want to dump data from one place to the other. So if you don't know, what kinds of questions you want to ask, or how you're going to use it, who the consumer of that's going to be, then you're going to kind of waste a lot of time and money here. So I think it's that's that's how I do it, right? So I start backwards and I say, so what's keeping you up at night, right? Like let's start there. What's keeping you up at night? What are some of the things that are going to impact what you do on a daily basis? That are going to impact the patients? That are going to impact the resources? And then you kind of move backwards and see the technology is there. And that's what I tell people all the time. And they're like, can you, yes. I don't know what your question is, but yes, the technology is there. But do we have the use cases? Do we have the people who are going to consume it? Do we have the people on the ground that are actually going to translate that into action? That's, that's a better question to, to really answer before you get started. Yeah. And these, these systems are all designed for the users, you know, primarily. So what, what do you extract, how do you assimilate it, what can you do with it, and then how do you create value out of it? And this is obviously you know, one, one vendor's product, so I'm really pleased that you guys have been able to come along and talk about where the technology is at and, and where you think it's going. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is more than a product, I think this is like a philosophy yeah. you know, of where you do what, right? where you do the heavy lifting, where you centralize that heavy lifting. So, you know, you, you will see this a lot in conceptual ways, but you know, we have it today, but it, it comes in different flavors. So. And hence my sort of little rant at the beginning about this idea of going, well, this is something that just gets extracted with a HREC and we go away and do research and maybe we do some translation and some findings and it goes into a journal and blah, 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 years later we actually pick it up in practice. I think the onus is on the health system because of the investment that they've been making to work out how to make use of this, and a completely valid use case here is research. But the idea of letting it go over there and not understanding the value of the research and the partnership that researcher brings when it connects to the data and the clinical practice, uh, I, I think I really think that's where it'll go. And I'll take that a step further. Actually, I I think ethically we have a responsibility to the patients to translate that into benefit yeah. to them because when when this data you know, once we provide data, we we don't consent for that. I mean, as we're going through the healthcare system, it's kind of happening to us, right? We're providing all this data, and that puts our, our privacy at risk. So we are risking something by being part of the system. So I think it's our responsibility, you know, obviously from the technology level to keep it secure, but to actually generate benefit from it, so. Yeah, and to engage, you know, people and their expectations of how it's going to be used, these sorts of ideas. So. In the My Health Record, the National Health Record, it's effectively a consent machine for patients consenting for information to be exchanged and for clinicians to consent. But the consent is built into the system, not exposed as a business service, <coughs> such that other organisations can go and look at that and a person can express their consent for how it might be used as that data travels around the system and gets used. So these are the sorts of ideas I think that we need to be looking at to really agree with you to address how people's expectations of the data's collection and use for work. Yeah, yeah. And, and genomic data has a whole other level of complexity with yeah. that because we don't even know what the answer is for a lot of things. So. Thank you. 
hospital, but then there also was you know, trained detectives uh, starting research studies as well. So it's being done a full time driver, which gives you know, great credit companies for uh, being able to sequester. But it's not necessarily ideal because we have full time hard data, the data on our trade it might not be the ultimate outcome. We've got a dog in the bones to free advertise station. It's not happening in Australia, happening everywhere in the world. But yes, that collaboration that you see, and, it, and generally when we approach an implementation, we try to recreate it again. And that's a really, that is, uh, you know, that's the result of a, that, that, that you can do in translational research. You can restart the wheel again, we start over there again, and we try to solve all the problems. And instead of leverage, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you an example of that. So, in, in terms of how technology enables that, so we had, I can't, I can't say this customer was, but we had a customer that you know wanted to start really ramping up their, their translational research uh, uh, program. And one of the issues they were having is that if um, if a certain panel was anthropology for a specific diagnosis, then researchers weren't allowed to use it for anything. So they had to be studying that specific um, uh, condition. So they had to go through this whole policy process where they actually um, used the method of our, our technology kind of role-based, um, um, the administrative part of access control to say, because if someone goes through the IRB process and then the IRB approves this, type, this data from this panel to be used for, you know, outside of oncology, so let's say like ophthalmology or something like that, then through the access control, we're able to trace exactly what they're accessing. We're able to parse down the data to only look at the parts of that of those results that are relevant for that IRB. So that's where technology can really help in in, in replicate and being able to really leverage all that data um, because the way that we've created our policy has been really, really strict, which you know, it's just a result of not knowing, of not being comfortable with the data, but um, that's one place where technology can really Going further, uh, in Australia, we've got a, a very good legislation on privacy, but also on how we are one of the best. And we don't use it because the technology doesn't allow to use it. And uh, you, you need to think it's a, it's a two way response. Sometimes, at the end of the day, the, all the researchers or the scientists end up in the hard drive of the science instead of being in the hard drive of the health system. And we got, you know, four or five frameworks that I quote the other day, remember from, from the legislation. But if you don't have the technology that fosters that, you won't be able to do it because you cannot access a EMR or you cannot access the lean. And then you have to do four or five screens and 72 clicks to get to it. And that discourages everyone. So we need to bring in, bring out, and, and try it. And it's not only your or technology is there. Okay, so um, uh, did you have another? Is it, uh, well, because we're going to have lunch, and I'm sure this conversation might might fly out, out there. Because um, I'm doing my best to stop talking. So, but Peter, if you've got a, well, just, uh, a very quick comment on the, the last slide about the spark line stuff in there, it's probably worth commenting. You've just made up the obvious to people. But one of the drivers for that is about the speed of analysis. And, yeah. and with the latest generation of underlying technology and that stuff, we're talking about 80 fold increase in, in analysis costs. So they're needing more for months to get it for genomics and for that. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's, there are a lot of implications about the cost of, yeah. of operation as well. So there's a whole whole thing there. But this is this is work that we're engaging with. E Health Queensland, Pathology Queensland, and Health Support Queensland, and, and lots of other groups to understand how to do this and, and build that evidence base. So, um, so that's you know the objective of the program. Um, so, I'd like you to join me in thanking uh, Alexandra for coming today and uh, travelling all the way from the uh, US and also touring all around Australia, uh, meeting with people and, and getting this conversation going, which is terrific. So, thank you very much.